Hi, everyone. We're just letting folks in right now. So let's just give it another moment or two, and then we'll start the program. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you everyone to joining tonight. We're just gonna be another moment as we're letting folks into the room. So just another minute or two. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to See Yourself Running, our See Yourself Running AAPI event. I'm Andrea Johnson. I'm a regional director at Run for Something, and we are so glad to have you and to be discussing running as an AAPI candidate this evening. If you're a current candidate or are thinking about running in the future, we hope this conversation tonight will help you think through how identity impacts your work as a candidate and as a community member. Before we get into the program, let me start with a little bit of housekeeping. We have a lot of people on the call tonight and we wanna to make sure everyone can participate. In a few minutes, I will be introducing our moderator for tonight's dis discussion. And then Amina will be speaking with our three wonderful elected officials who have specific experiences to share with you about running while AAPI. In the meantime, if you would like to introduce yourself in the chat, please do. Make sure your settings are set to all panelists and attendees and share your name, where you are, and what brought you to the call this evening. After we get through our introductions, we will then open the floor up to questions. So please put any questions you have for the panel in the Q&A box. We will be pulling the questions from there. We definitely want to address your questions about running while API. So please think of your questions, but it will be tough for us to catch the questions in the chat box. So please put any questions you have in the for the panel in the Q&A box. Feel free to use the chat box to comment on the program or interact with other attendees. I hope this will be a great chance to get to know people and help build community. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get into the program. Tonight, we're very excited to be focusing on AAPI candidates and running as an AAPI candidate and within AAPI communities. To put it bluntly, we need more AAPI people running for office and getting elected across this country. We know that the label Asian American and Pacific Islander glosses over a remarkable amount of diversity in the community and encompasses a vast range of national, geographic, ethnic, racial, and experiential variants which makes it impossible to talk about a singular AAPI experience in this, in this country. Tonight, our panel represents a wide range of identities and experiences, but certainly doesn't represent all. So we hope that you'll share your own experience in the chat tonight. While acknowledging the diversity in the community, we can definitely say one thing about the AAPI experience in the United States, and that is that AAPI people are absolutely underrepresented in our elected officials. A recent study from the Reflective Democracy Campaign established that while AAPI people are 6.1% of the US population, only 0.9% of elected officials in this country are AAPI. While this community is the fastest growing segment of our population, the number of AAPI elected officials isn't anywhere close to keeping pace to that community growth. In fact, the AAPI community has the worst rates of representation relative to total population share of any major demographic group in this country. And that needs to change. Even though many states and municipalities have substantial AAPI communities, Hawaii is the only state that comes close to AAPI representation that matches population share. So it is safe to say that wherever you're joining us from tonight, we need more AAPI representation there. I also want to briefly undercut the belief that AAPI candidates or any BIPOC candidate can only be elected in communities where their ethnicity or race represents the majority of voters. The study I mentioned earlier found that of the 15 current Asian American and Pacific Islander members of the US Congress, almost half were elected in majority white districts. So please don't let the demographics of your district dissuade you from running for office. 
At Run for Something, we believe that you can't be what you can't see. So increasing representation from young AAPI candidates is one of our key objectives in 2021. But we want to do more than just encourage you to run. We want to create an environment where you know you will be supported and uplifted for all parts of your identity. Tonight's call is a place for us to come together as a political community invest, invested in AAPI candidates from all walks of life to provide honest advice, answer questions, and create a community of support that, will, that you will need when you step up to run for office. So let me start by telling you a little more about Run for Something, then I'll introduce our moderator who will fill you in on the New American Leaders Action Fund and introduce our panel. Broadly, Run for Something is all about encouraging young, diverse progressives to run for office, especially at the down ballot level. More specifically, Run for Something endorses diverse progressive candidates who are 40 and under, running for the first or second time, and running for down ballot offices, which includes city council, mayor, county commission, state legislature, school board, and even county clerk or register of deeds. Since Run for Something started in 2017, we have identified more than 75,000 young people who want to run for office and have endorsed 1,450 all-star candidates in all 50 states. So far, Run for Something has elected more than 503 candidates to state and local office, and we have folks on the ballot tonight across the country, so we're hoping for some more wins this evening. And our winners are 56% women, 55% people of color, and 20% LGBTQIA+. You may have seen our social media work or our national run for office day, which are just a few of the ways we encourage young people to run. But we also provide bespoke custom coaching, customized coaching for our endorsed candidates to support you through every phase of your campaign. We provide resources and trainings and connect candidates with partners who can help their campaigns. We also work with our alumni to support current candidates and to make connections that will help them govern successfully once elected. We do this because we know that more young, diverse, and exciting progressives running strong grassroots campaigns in every community will increase the immediate turnout for Democrats up and down the ticket and help build political power for often underrepresented groups across the country. We also know that doing this work will change the conversation about who is electable in this country. At Run for Something, we focus on down ballot races because we know that these local county and state offices are often the ones with the most direct influence on most people's everyday lives. Elected officials at this level are the ones that set police budgets, determine local anti-discrimination ordinances, and set housing and commercial zoning rules that can define our communities. Down ballot offices determine what our kids learn in schools, what reproductive health resources are available in our communities, and who gets access to the vote and how elections are run. And racial justice and anti-racism starts at the community level. So as we all work to dismantle white supremacy and the racist institutions that surround us, it is crucial that we elect down ballot candidates that will engage that fight with the focus we deserve. This year in 2021, the need for AAPI representation and getting community members into position of, positions of power in our cities and states is even more pressing as violence, racism, and hate against the AAPI community is impacting communities across this country. Having an AAPI woman in the vice presidency is something to celebrate, but it isn't enough. We need AAPI elected officials at all levels of government. So we truly hope this call will either help you in your run or convince you to consider running in your community. Okay, with that said, I'd like to introduce our fabulous panel moderator this evening. Amina Ahmed is the manager of the Midwest Regional Program and the Fellows Program at the New American Leaders Action Fund. Before arriving at NALAF, she had an extensive history with nonprofits and community groups that fought for social justice and representation, including heading up the Asian Pacific Islander American Vote Michigan Group. She is a third culture kid and is herself a former candidate. She ran for school board in 2018, which is awesome. And we wanna encourage you all to consider running yourself tonight. She is also an alum of the New American Leaders Ready to Lead and Ready to Win program. Finally, one of my favorite things about Amina is that she has an educational history in molecular biology and is an expert at both using data and building authentic, powerful relationships. So with that said, I'll hand it off to Amina tonight now. Thank you so much, Andrea. Welcome everyone. So happy to see you all here. We're grateful that you've joined us. 
And I'll start by telling you a little bit about New American Leaders Action Fund. At New American Leaders Action Fund, our vision and mission is to build a democracy that represents and includes all of us by engaging new voters, supporting new Americans as they run for office, and expanding civic engagement. We believe that all people should be represented in government, and we know that this means training, supporting, and electing leaders who share life experiences and values with their communities. And they make sure that every voice is heard and included in key policy decisions. Often as new voices to our democracy, their perspectives and hard work one participation must be included at every level of government and represented in places of power, whether that be school board or Congress. We think we need people like us everywhere. And I'm so excited about today's panel. I'll take this time to introduce our first panelist, who is an elected, um, one of my sheroes. She's the first Muslim American woman to be elected to office in North Carolina. And her name is Nida Alam. She is on the Durham County Board of Commissioners in North Carolina. And she was one of five women to win the primary for the five seats on that board. Prior to her run, uh, she worked as a political director for Senator Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign in 2016. And she was elected as third vice chair of the North Carolina Democratic Party, becoming the first Muslim American to serve on the party's executive council. She's also served as chair of Durham Mayor's Council for Women, serving as a liaison between women and city government officials in an effort to improve the quality of life for women in Durham. Alam was driven to politics in 2015 after three of her best friends who were all Muslim American students, Dia Barakat, Razan and Yusser Abu Salha were shot and killed by their neighbor in Chapel Hill. This was an incident that really changed, I think, how the Muslim American community viewed themselves. And I'm very grateful that in Nida's case, uh, when she saw the lack of outrage and she saw the dismissal of the incident initially as a parking dispute, she was reminded of the ways the Muslim community experiences trauma and how that can be overlooked and disregarded. And so instead of giving up, instead of crumbling, Nida decided to run for office and fortunately she won. I'm so grateful and honored to introduce her. And just a reminder that she's the first Muslim American woman to be elected to office in North Carolina. So welcome Nida. Thank you so much Amina and thank you Run for Something and New American Leaders for hosting this amazing panel. And I'm really excited to hear from the other electeds who are on this call. As Amina mentioned, like my journey into politics wasn't a typical one that you would hear. I honestly never expected myself to ever run for office or to become an organizer even. Um, I studied sustainable materials and technology at uh, NC State University. And my parents always planned like my dad's vision for me and my sisters was that we would one day have our own companies and start our own businesses and be self-sufficient, strong uh, women. And both of my sisters decided to go down that path. However, in 2015, I was finishing up my last year of uh, college when I lost my best friend Yasser Wusalha, her sister Razan, and her husband of seven weeks, Dia, in a hate crime, but and their neighbor uh, murdered them because they were Muslim Americans. And the immediate, as Amina had mentioned, the immediate response from the police chief was that it was over a parking dispute. And that's what the national media ran with. That's what everyone, when they spoke about the Yusun Razan, it was always, it was just a parking dispute. So to hear their lives minimized and everything that they had accomplished in their short 20 uh, something years in this world, just to somebody hated them over a parking spot, didn't sit well with me. And I realized like, you know, the case took about four years to be seen through. And throughout that entire process, I started to learn how few uh, laws there were in North Carolina and how weak the hate crime prevention laws were in our state to protect 
uh, people of all faith backgrounds, um, sexual orientation and genders from hate crimes. And that's what really decided, I decided I wanted to be a change because if anyone can minimize the Muslim voice to just being lost over a parking dispute is because we're not having enough real conversations. You know, growing up, we were always told you don't get involved in politics, especially in a post 9-11 world. We were just like, just stay out of it. Um, and I realized that that couldn't be an answer anymore because if we weren't speaking up for ourselves, then someone else is gonna be writing our stories and it's not gonna be an accurate story. And so that's why I started to look at the presidential campaigns that were about to kick off. The Sanders campaign really resonated with me because he spoke about Muslim Americans and immigrants as people who want to be contributing members of society and not as your typical, the stereotypes that the media always talks about us. And I, after I worked for him, I came back and was elected vice chair of the state party where my focus was um, doing outreach to minority communities, not just when we need their votes right before an election, but all year round, even in the off election cycles that we need to be going to places of worship, community centers, going to places where people already are and asking them how their elected officials at every level are impacting them and having round tables with their elected officials. And that working at that level and getting to see how direct local politics actually impacts people's lives, we tend to focus on federal office. Um, but I got to see, you know, how a city council member, a school board member, a county commissioner actually directly impacts people's lives every day. And that's what I decided. I was like, I want to run for local office. I've been advocating, I've been organizing for people. And I decided to put my hat in the ring. And it definitely wasn't an easy process the entire time, but it was definitely meaningful, especially the times where, you know, I would see kids who saw me in my headscarf and would get excited to see that a Muslim woman was running. Um, I'd get excited that my, my parents got to vote for me. Um, they voted by mail for me and I got to take a picture of them. And it was like their excitement as immigrants to this country to be able to check off the box for their uh, daughter, their youngest daughter, which is really exciting. And all of those are moments that really outshine some of the negativity that I've had to endure because it's a greater purpose to be able to run for office and serve as the first Muslim woman uh, in North Carolina elected to office. Because even though I'm the first, I know I'm not going to be the last and I hope to make sure that I'm not the last by supporting other young Muslim women and other young immigrants uh, to run for office. Thank you so much, Nida, and appreciate that. That's what I love about the first that we come across. Inevitably, they always talk about how they do not wanna be the last and they wanna pave the way and encourage others to join them. Thank you so much. And now I'll introduce our second panelist who is State Representative Sam Park. And he serves in the Georgia State House. He's been busy protecting our democracy, fighting against the assaults on voting rights. Um, it's been a pretty tough legislative session for him. Sam is the first Asian American Democrat and the first openly gay man elected to the Georgia State Legislature. He's the grandson of refugees from the Korean War and the son of Korean immigrants. Sam's a native Georgian and was raised by a single mom. He became not only the first openly gay man and the first Asian American Democrat, um, he's also the first lawyer in his family. After Sam's mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer, he ran for office and he wanted to ensure that every single resident in Georgia had access to healthcare. Don't anybody let you tell, tell you that you can't beat an incumbent. As a first time candidate, he challenged and unseated a three term Republican chairwoman winning by 460 votes. Currently Sam serves in leadership as a deputy whip in the Georgia House Democratic Caucus and is chair of the Gwinnett State House delegation. In his personal capacity, Sam serves as general counsel for Positive Impact Health Centers, which is the largest AIDS surface organization in Georgia working to end the HIV epidemic. At New American Leaders Action Fund and Run for Something, Sam's a dear friend, and we're so pleased to turn it over to hear from Sam. 
Uh, well, well, thank you so much and, and happy to be here with everyone. Um, again, thank you, New American Leaders and Run for Something. Oh, sorry, Kat. Um, she will run back and forth, so you'll have to excuse her for that. Um, but, but really, thank y'all for all the transformative work uh, y'all have been doing, particularly in terms of supporting candidates uh, like myself to run for office um, as we're continuing to go through demographic changes across this country. Um, I think it's so, so, so important, the work that y'all do, um, particularly in light of my own experiences running as a first time candidate back in 2016, where one of the challenges that I faced along with personal questions as to whether or not this was the right decision for me uh, was, am I viable? Am I viable as a uh, openly gay, uh, gay uh, Korean American millennial in Georgia um, trying to you know, challenge a three term Republican incumbent? I think the vast majority of folks on both sides of the political aisle thought that I was not. Um, and of course, in challenging a three term uh, Republican chairwoman during a general election, uh, the odds without a doubt were stacked against me. Um, but one of the, I, I learned many lessons, but one of the things that I realized is you have to first and foremost, especially as a candidate, uh, lean into your own identity. You have to know yourself, you have to know your purpose and the reason why you're running. Because um, when all is said and done, especially as a leader, as an elected official, it starts with you. Um, and, and so you don't know the power you have until you actually try. Um, and, and to the last uh, comment that uh, Nida mentioned, without a doubt, you will not be the last. Uh, back in 2016, uh, I was the only Asian American currently serving in the Georgia State Legislature, and now there are five. And, and we're continuing to hopefully see more and, and continuing to hopefully engage Asian American communities to turn out and use the power that they have to vote, uh, which we of course saw during the general um, election in 2020. Uh, and during the runoff elections where we saw, again, an unprecedented surge in Asian American voters uh, 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 voting for the first time in many instances that helped change the course of our state as well as our country. And so, you know, it's those small ripple effects that stem perhaps from the one act of bravery, uh, that, that leap of faith that you may take when, when running for office in which you don't know what hangs in the balance and, and the enormous amount of good that you can do uh, for your community and for your country. Um, and you don't have to run for Congress to do it. Um, you could do it at the local and state level where uh, so much transformative change is possible and very, very much needed. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, you know, I'm you know, born and raised in Georgia. This is uh, my home. Um, I haven't really lived anywhere else. And, you know, growing up in a low, from a low income uh, immigrant background, uh, politics, running for office, that was never really uh, within, you know, my orbit. Um, I, I had no intention of running for office uh, growing up. Uh, my primary focus, uh, you know, going into college and, and figuring out my next steps from there was financial stability. Uh, what would be the best way in which I can ensure that my family would have a roof over our head since that was one of the primary challenges that, you know, I faced growing up my, my entire life. Um, it wasn't until 2014, um, well, I, sh I should go back to 2012. Uh, so it was during law school, which is the first time I really had exposure uh, to politics and the legislative process. Uh, back in 2012, I had an opportunity to intern for Stacey Abrams, uh, who was minority leader of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus at that time. Um, and I came to her so upset over a piece of legislation Republicans at the time were pushing that would have drug tested TANF recipients, uh, TANF being an acronym for Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, 80% uh, of which in the state of Georgia were women and children. And so I thought that this was, this was just a terrible bill um, stigmatizing people in need and ultimately imposing barriers for a program that was created to help um, um, those who needed some additional assistance, uh, women and children in particular. Um, and, and so through that process, Stacey Abrams really gave me an opportunity to learn about the legislative process, learn about how much good we can do through public, pro uh, public policy um, again, at the state level, which is you know, my first exposure to the political process. 
Um, all of that to say, again, I had no interest uh, in running for office, uh, especially as a gay man uh, in Georgia, where you know just a few years prior in 2010, um, our, our state amended its constitution to define marriage as between a man and a woman. And of course, growing up in the deep South, um, as an example, when I was 13 years old, that's when Matthew Shepard was brutally tortured and murdered for being gay. Uh, so the idea of running as an openly gay candidate um, was, was something that in my mind was a threat to my life and, and my safety. And so all of that to say, public policy became something that really captured my attention and fascination because it was really an opportunity, the politics aside, uh, to come together from different backgrounds and try and solve challenging uh, systemic issues, um, which ideally the legislative process permits. Um, as Madison writes, you know, the, the legislative process forces people of ambition to compromise um, and, and ultimately, again, make progress on the collective challenges uh, that we all face. Um, that said, in 2014, um, that's when I began thinking I should actually run for office and throw my hat into the political arena. Um, in the beginning of 2014, Republican, our Republican-led legislature not only blocked Medicaid expansion, they made it harder to expand Medicaid, taking the power away from the governor and requiring a majority of members in both the House and the Senate to pass in order for it to move forward. Um, of course, in Georgia, uh, we have more than half a million uninsured low-income Georgians, one of the highest uninsured rates in the country that continues to exacerbate a lot of the healthcare challenges that we continue to face, including one of the highest maternal and infant mortality rates in the country and, and, and an HIV AIDS epidemic, uh, which I'm familiar with as that's um, an area in which I've, I've dedicated my private capacity to trying to address. Um, but that big policy issue of Medicaid expansion uh, for me became suddenly personal uh, at the end of 2014 in December after my mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Um, the, the big policy issue became personal. And, and, and I think that's important, especially for those who are thinking about running for office uh, to again, try and know what your purpose and, and reason for running. Um, the question that I was asked that really helped hone my reasons for running for office was what breaks your heart, right? Know what breaks your heart and then do something about it to the best of your ability. And, and so knowing that access to healthcare is a matter of life or death as, as public health insurance gave my mom a fighting chance um, and knowing that half a million Georgians, 500,000 people did not have that same opportunity, that was something that broke my heart. And so knowing the odds stacked against me, I felt it necessary um, to do what I could with the hardship that I faced um, to, to you know, serve my fellow Georgians, to share that story, uh, which is exactly what I did, talking to thousands of, of my neighbors um, and ultimately building grassroots uh, momentum and a campaign um, in a, in a very multiracial, multi-generational um, coalition, I should say as well, given the demographics of my district, and ultimately won. Um, you know, I, again, I was, uh, you know, I, I think to a certain degree, it surprised me that I was ultimately successful, um, just given how difficult the challenges were. Um, but again, it's one of those things in which first and foremost, you don't know the power you have until you actually try and exert it. Um, and then two, the amount of good that you can do, um, again, is, is something that you can't measure. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to do what you can and then trust that, uh, you know, again, the impact when all is said and done um, is, is, is maybe and, and, and perhaps much bigger than, than you may imagine. Uh, but happy to answer, um, you know, any questions that y'all may have and, and looking forward to a conversation this evening as well. Thank you, Representative Park. And yes, a reminder that if you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A box. And when we finish hearing from everyone, we will then start uh, having them answer the questions. But I, I know sometimes questions occur to us as someone's speaking, so please feel free to put it in the question and answer box. Um, I will now introduce uh, a city council member 
And again, a first. So Nelsie Yang is the first Hmong American woman elected as a council member in the history of St. Paul. She's also the youngest to be elected. She was sworn in in January, 2020. Nelsie is the daughter of Hmong refugees and she's the youngest of five children. Similar to our other panelists, she has a background in social justice activism. She also has a background in social work. She was inspired to get involved in political organizing to create the change she wanted to see. And she knew her lived experiences growing up in systemic poverty and racism were valuable. She has a vision of co-governing and she chooses to co-govern alongside her community, labor unions and other organizations because she wants to build a society where working families live lives that are long, fulfilled and joyful. She's a dedicated fighter an organizer and a former union steward. One of the issues she's worked on is the campaign to raise the minimum wage to $15. She's worked on passing earned sick and uh, safe time, renters rights, and other campaigns around small businesses, the right to protect our democracy, and the list goes on and on. We know that with Nelsie in the city council, that community has a champion. And she, she, her, she aims to not leave anybody out. And I would love to turn it over to Nelsi to hear more from her directly about her experience. Hi everyone, it's so great to be here with all of you. So thank you to Run For Something for inviting me to be on the panel here. And thank you everyone for tuning in to tonight's panel as well. I was thinking about what to share as I came to the table um, today, and one of the things that I wanted to focus on was what, what I feel would have been helpful for me when um, I was a candidate and what has also been very helpful for me as an elected official right now as well, um, because I don't think that the two different, or for lack of better words, arenas are any different. Um, the two are, are very similar and at the same um, the same experience that you have on the campaign trail also shows up as you are an elected official as well, which for those of you who are running, we hope that you get there and that you get elected. So one of the things I wanted to focus on today was courage. And courage is very, very important to me because I don't believe that anything that we do is easy at all. Uh, being a person of color is not easy. Being a woman is not easy. Being LGBTQ is not easy, nor is running for office and also being in elected office. All of the things that we do require us to be courageous and to draw that forward in order to build the type of world that we envision for our future. And when I ran for office, um, I was 23 years old. I, that was in 2018, I was a first time candidate. And in order to be able to make the decision to, to run, I had to be courageous and think about all of the different things that people would say about me, the good and the, the bad as well. And I focused a bit more on the, the negative things people would say because I knew that those were the things that hurt the most. And um, just because of like the, the type of society we live in, in which we operate off of scarcity and we're taught that we are not enough and that we're not worth it. I knew that those would be most painful and that I needed to have courage if I wanted to run for office so that I can battle those, um, those uh, negative, negative rhetoric head on. And so I hope that from what I share today that it will prep you for your race and, and also get you ready to make the decision to run and to be in elected office as well. So some of the things that I thought about is, you know, for me, I was a young person. I was 23 years old at the time. And I knew that ageism would be something that came up uh, that I faced head on, even as an elected official, which I still experience to this day. But I knew that there was so much value behind having young people in office and making decisions for our communities because we bring in the freshest ideas that are not tainted by 
doing business as usual, rebringing our full self. And we also are at a critical point in our society now where we are radicalizing self-care and building systems that are rooted in care rather than, rather than the punitive systems rooted in racism, sexism, classism. And so that was actually such a deep asset and something that I keep sharing to young people, even in my role as a council member going and speaking to people to young people, I really emphasize the value that we bring to the community. The other thing is, I um, was, you know, in my own uh, AAPI community, and I wonder if some of you resonate with this too, like I am a daughter, I am a Hmong daughter. And so one of the things I often heard uh, along uh, the campaign trail is, gosh, it's just too bad that you were not born a son. That is the reality for us as um, Asian women uh, who put our, or, you know, uh, who put ourselves out in the front lines, something that we face head on. And I want you to know about that because in those moments, it's really important for you to have a team around you who is here to to hold you when times are tough and to rem to ground you that you are worth it and that you are meant to be in this role of a person in in power making decisions for your community mm -hmm. and for for me uh some of the when i think about who those people are some of the first um, few people who pop into my mind are my parents my mom and dad who who didn't even feed into that negativity at all when people said that right to them in their face. And instead they turned to me and they're like, you just show them that you can do it, you're gonna win. And so here I am today in the St. Paul City Council. The other thing is I was a renter too. And I lived in the East side right now where I represent. I only uh, lived here for three years. However, my family members, when they came from uh, they took refuge here from uh, Thailand and Laos, like the, the east side was where they grew up. And so I often came to the east side of St. Paul and um, and I was a renter. I was really, really, um, I was proud to live in the east side community. I was just, you know, out of college and knew that when I was done, I would come here and live with my the rest of my family members. And there was so much rhetoric around renters, really, people, uh, there's like this dominant story about renters not being living here in the community and here to stay long term that we're just a very transit uh, community just moving from home to home, which is not true at all. And in a community like St. Paul, where more than half of our families are renters, what a shame that that story even exists about our own people living in the city of St. Paul. We actually really needed someone who was the renter at the table fighting for tenant rights, fighting for a policies that would protect renters and make sure that they were able to live here long term. These are all things that are really important to me. And, um, and also what I really hold true to my work in the St. Paul City Council today um, I was elected in uh, in 2019, so that was when I was 24. I was the first Hmong American woman elected to the St. Paul City Council and also the youngest person as well. And I knew that uh, that when I, that actually that day when I got elected, that was literally the first day of when my job, my work started. A lot of us think it's when the campaign trail, we begin the campaign trail, but that is not true at all. You need to go through the campaign to get to where you need to be, which is in public office. And you have to be ready to hit the ground running. So um, in, in order to be able to do that, right? Like you have to be able to have courage even as you are in elected office, because right now, yeah, in, in St. Paul as a council member, I often find myself in meetings where I am the only person of color or I am the only woman. And I get asked, one of the first few asks um, that I often get is, hey, can you help us get more people of color to sit on our boards? That's the most common ask. And I know that it is because I am someone who is uh, you know, Asian and also a person of color as well. But that really also shows me that it matters to have you in the room because people know that you also know people, you know your community and you know many other communities that that are, are um, when we do business as usual and elect folks who are old white men in office, we don't get that same access and network. 
And so to have you there is really important. And for me as um, a council member, it is so important to keep investing in leaders because I know that I, as a council member, cannot do this work alone. I need to do it in deep co-governance with other API leaders, with other leaders of color to actually achieve the future that we want. And so you are someone who is so important to the community. You are so worth this opportunity. And uh, I hope that you go for it and feel free to lean on to me as someone who is here rooting you on and here to give you advice as well. I love it. I love the commitment to root others on and we hope that all of you do run for something and please contact us. We are happy to help train you, coach you, um, everything. And thank you so much, Nelsie, for sharing. We will now move into the question and answer session of the program. Uh, please, again, a reminder, please put your questions in the question and answer uh, box versus the chat box. And so I will open it with a question on something very dear to my heart, which is Islamophobia. And so one of the attendees asks, in 2018 in Maryland, an AAPI candidate with a troublesome record of Islamophobia ran for Congress and nearly won the Democratic primary. When Muslim American and young millennial API activists brought attention to this, older AAPI gatekeepers smeared them and gaslit activists. How can young activists work to overcome such challenges and bring together all AAPI communities in election season? And now see if you don't mind starting and then we can have others chime in. Thank you. Do you have the question written somewhere? That way yeah, I if you go to the Q&A box, it's right there. And while you're reviewing it, if you, if you, if you wanna review it and then I'll have Nida jump in. Is okay. that okay? Yeah, yes. Nida, go ahead. Yeah, honestly, the first thing that comes to my mind when I read this question is just thinking, is organizing to get a candidate that everyone can rally around and finding a candidate, whether it's yourself or a community member that you know, and start supporting them to run for office. Um, oftentimes, we may fall into this conflict where there's you know, even in the Muslim community, uh, when I talk about uh, some political issues, they may not always agree with me. But um, because I am a little bit more far more progressive than the older parts of uh, my community. But that's the thing is that we need to recruit candidates that truly speak for our voices. And if there are people who are running who don't represent us and don't represent what we want to see our community uh, serving in that leadership position and with that with those policy agendas is we need to run for office because it is really unfortunate that there is uh, a lot of xenophobia and Islamophobia within our own uh, communities um, to and to not address it. There is a lot of uh, unfortunately discrimination amongst uh, even within the AAPI community itself um, and it needs to be addressed. Um, and if we, the younger generation, aren't going to address it, it's going to continue as the status quo. So being strong and, you know, unfortunately, there's going to be times where you get attacked by gatekeepers and um, elders in the community. But I think a lot of organizers I've seen, they've built organized like grassroots movements um, and communicating at the grassroots level, going door knocking uh, for the candidate that you do support, a candidate that has the message that you believe in and giving them everything you can is really the best uh, strategy. Thank you, Nida. Now, or Sam, would you like to chime in? I can, yeah, I can go next. Go ahead, Nelsie. Thank you so much for the question. It is, it comes packed with like so many layers of what I call political analysis and all of that, because I'll, I'll, I want to share with you that when I started, first started organizing in 2015, like I, I felt like at the time, what was most important was getting people of color elected, period. And I remember there was a moment when I was talking to one of our um, elected officials, I was at the Capitol with them and I said, yeah, like I, I really love the work that I do, you know, getting people of color elected, that representation is really important to me. And something they said really sticks with me to this day. And I carry that with me because it's, it's so true. Um, he said to me, that is really important. However, I want you to remember that 
it's actually even more important that we have people in office who are here fighting for working families, who are here fighting to make sure that, that everyone is making a livable wage, that they're getting earned sick and safe time, and that we're supporting um, we're supporting, you know, racially like deep, deep radical uh, racial and social justice that uh, eliminates the punitive systems and uh, the the punitive systems we live in, and that really stuck to me because it showed me that there's actually like a deeper meaning to to what we talk about when we are doing work to elect folks or when we when we think about like who we want at the decision making table. Because I'll be honest with you, I have met. Um, you know, API folks, folks of color who do not share the, the same values as all the things I listed earlier, and that they will cause um, as much harm as the harm that we are living in now and that we're trying to, to reform or to even start from anew. And so it's, it's really important for us to stay grounded in that. And I, I also do feel that it is our young folks who, who bring in these fresh experiences around racism, around sexism, and have had the platform to be really open about that. Um, and why, they're, why they are talking about the real things that you know, older generations do not talk about. And I, I'm saying that for me personally as a Hmong daughter who has gone through this experience before um, with that clash with like our older Hmong generation. And it's important to build uh, bridges. And it's also important to, to recognize that there are things that we believe in that um, are non-negotiable and that we have to continue fighting for it no matter the tension and the backlash that we experience. Because that backlash and, experience, uh, and, that backlash and resistance actually shows us that we are fighting in the first place. Thank you so much. So, so yeah, go ahead, in. Sam. Yep, go Thank ahead, you. Sam. So, so yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, it's always very important while challenging to hold our own people accountable, um, right? Whether it's fellow Asian Americans, whether it's fellow folks on your side of the political aisle, mm -hmm. uh, we have to do our own part to hold um, our, our own folks accountable, especially if we're fighting for progress, if we're fighting for change. Um, you know, all of that to say, um, you know, there's two things I'll add to this conversation um, for this question. But one, if you look at the history of Asian Americans uh, in this country, um, you know, we reached a nadir in the 1950s after passage of uh, the Immigration Nationality Act in 1921, uh, where there was a steady increase of Asian Americans from all backgrounds, right? Along with the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, you know, all that to say, you know, there seems to be a disconnect between a lot of Asian Americans who ended up immigrating here after the 1965 reforms that removed a lot of these racially discriminatory quotas in which we have to relearn our history. And, and we have to understand that as Asian Americans, uh, we have faced discrimination before and the best way in which we can combat it is if we stand together with all communities who may be facing discrimination of any kind, whether it's because of your, your, the color of your skin, ethnicity or religion, sexual orientation, whatever it may be. Um, and, and so I, I think one of the ways in which we can begin bridging the divide that exists between older Asian Americans who tend to be conservative, who may have immigrated here in the 1980s with the mindset that I'm gonna be quiet, um, I'm, I'm not going to speak out because I'm simply grateful for the opportunity to be here um, with the truth and uh, of our own history that we have access to that is being taught to us um, to understand, to first and foremost, I think, ground our communities in the truth um, in order for us to thrive, but also to begin building um, um, bridges with older Asian American communities um, with an understanding that, again, um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, as Dr. King said. Thank you, Sam. Thank you all so much. Let's move on to the next question, which is around one of our favorite topics and one of the things that actually serves as a barrier to people running, which is fundraising. So we have a question that says, it often costs a lot of money to run for local offices where I am. What's a smart strategy to fundraise as an API candidate without a large network? Uh, Sam, you want to start and then we'll go 
in the other order? Sure. So fund it, fundraising is important, but it, it is not determinative, right? It is not dispositive as to who wins or who loses. Um, and I think for uh, new American candidates, I think fundraising is always a challenge to a certain degree because, you know, quite frankly, we don't have as an established base going back generations. Um, all of that to say, as an example, when I first ran for office, um, my opponent had three times as much money uh, from beginning to end, and yet I was still successful. Um, I, I've heard instances in which uh, new American candidates, first time candidates uh, from, you know, younger generation, from the younger generation, you know, their opponents had 10 times, 15 times more money than them. Um, all that to say, I think, ultimately, it's a matter of how you utilize the money you're able to raise and invest um, as, as, as efficiently and effectively as possible. So for me, it was always people, right? How do we foster with what resources we have available direct face-to-face, person-to-person communications. Um, and you know, when all is said and done, it, it's to a certain degree time that, that at least uh, when I was running as a first-time candidate, that mattered more than dollars, right? It was the time that I could set aside to knock on doors all day, volunteers and their time that they lent me, along with you know, being kind of young college students and high school students um, who believed in me, um, that, that ultimately mattered more than how much money that they had. But, you know, when it comes to just the nuts and bolts of fundraising, always start small, right? You know, ask every single person that you've met, uh, you know, five, 10, 15, $20 and, and keep building upon what you can. Uh, every single dollar really does matter. And, and last thing I would say real quick, um, as someone who's been in office for five years, gone through three state elections, most competitive general elections, fundraising is always tough. Um, whether you are a first time candidate or a candidate who's been around for a little while, fundraising is I think at least from my, in my opinion, one of the hardest things to do. So best of luck. And I think I'll just add, um, as Sam mentioned, it's really tough to fundraise and no candidate enjoys it. Uh, nobody really likes asking for money. It's a very awkward thing you have to do. If you ever run into a candidate that says they like fundraising, they're either lying to you or they have some sort of magical finance director on their team. Um, but yeah, as Sam mentioned, reach out to your initial network of your family and friends. Um, and start to also look at, you know, there's different, if you bring, find a person who's like experienced with finance in your community, and by your community, I don't mean just AAPI, I mean like in general, in your district, in your region, who can help you pull lists of people who've donated to candidates uh, who have similar values as you. Um, that information is uh, public. Uh, I know in North Carolina it's public, I don't know the laws for every state about what level it's public information. But if you contribute to someone, you can have a finance person who looks up like, oh, this donor supported someone who supports $15 minimum wage. This donor donated to someone who is also a PI. And finding people and donors and connecting with them and having introductory calls with them, telling them about yourself and really pitching yourself and your vision uh, for the community and why you're running for office and remembering, and there's that awkward space, you know, I would always get, uh, I would always struggle because I'd feel like I'm asking them for pers money personally, but that's not the case. You're asking money for a movement that you support and you just so happen to be the face of that movement for the moment, but it's for a broader purpose and remembering that and really explaining that to your donors that, you know, these are the values that you're supporting by contributing 50 or 100 or whatever amount of money dollars to me. Hey, um, Sam, I was gonna say like, it's so incredible hearing about your experience. Like, thank you so much for sharing that. I was trying to look for the reaction to give you a big, big clap. <laughs> um, that was really amazing to hear. I, I also echo everything that's been said. I feel there's so much power to um, bringing people along in your campaign and to have them be a part of your team in, in raising money. It is a, a daunting task, especially, uh, you know, when I think back to being a 23 year old, um, just recently graduated from college and renter as well. Like my, my friends, you know, my direct network, they were also people who were in college at the time too. 
um, they gave uh, however much they could, like $10, $20, that really made a difference. And I know that they wish they could have gave more, but they just weren't able to at the time. Um, I would have been in the same position as well if someone had asked me to, to uh, give to the max to their campaign. I would know I wouldn't have been able to, but I really leaned into the power of organizing and organize people to be on my team and to raise money with me because I believe that it is um, so much more doable and tangible to have, for example, 20 people fundraising $1,000 each than one person fundraising $20,000 alone. I would wonder if you all feel the same way too, because it is seriously so true. And that is something that I saw happen before my eyes um, in my, I, when I wear a different um, hat in, in campaigning. Like I also coach candidates and literally um, one of the candidates who I coach, you know, when she uh, reported her campaign finance report, like this is how she got to $20,000. She organized people to raise $1,000 each. And so really, um, you know, be creative and also uh, reject the, the stories that we get told about ourselves that we need to do this work in isolation because no one can do it alone, but, but as a collective, we can do it. I also want to add that for I see so much value behind being a part of or attending trainings to learn how to fundraise money effectively. I'm sure um, in your area or even nowadays virtually, there are many fundraising trainings that are hosted. So I encourage you to be a part of those and to also um, build relationships with organizations and people who share your same values and um, get to know them and build re uh, rela relationships and proposition them or formally ask them to be a part of your team as well. Thank you for that great reminder. None of us can do it alone and we definitely need our teams. And part of how we show how we lead is by bringing people along with us. So we will move to another uh, tactical question, which is, what would you do different in your next campaign? If there's one thing you would do differently, what would it be? And we can start with Nida this time. I think one thing I would do differently is prioritize more self for myself and my family during the campaign. I think, um, well, my campaign was also like a sprint. Filing was in uh, March and the prime, or sorry, filing was in December and the primary was in March. So everything was like, go, go, go. And oftentimes I'd forget to eat meals. I wouldn't uh, make time to just, you know, go on a walk and spend time with family. So I think if one thing I were to do differently is make a schedule where I'm taking care of myself um, and prioritizing my own well-being because, you know, I've learned now as an elected official that you're only as you can only do so much good for the community if you're not taking care of yourself as well. Um, so that's definitely one thing I do and also prioritize your own mental health well being. Um, it can definitely be taxing to be a candidate, um, you'll be attacked personally um, at different levels so making sure that you find a safe space uh, to talk about that, whether it's with a healthcare professional or with a close knit group of family and friends but making sure you create that space um, before you kick things off or even while you're in the heat of things, but just taking a moment to step away. Thank you. Nelsie, what would you do differently in your next campaign? If I could do it all over again, I would make sure that my timeline was not up to election day, that what I was actually striving for was building a campaign that was here long-term and deeply sustainable, where I'm constantly building a team to raise money, engage with folks, because like I said earlier, your first day of, of you know, working as an elected official and being an elected official and a leader in your community is not when you get elected, it's when it's like after you get elected, that's really when the movement comes because uh, while you do governance work in your official council member role, county commissioner role, whatever it is, you're still gonna need to make sure that you have a team you can fall back on and to have be your rock when times get hard. 
And they're still going to have to go out and engage the community to go and fight for the issues that you are, are working for in your official uh, government role. And so that's actually something that I, within my campaign role, I'm getting up and running. It's really exciting. And I really believe that um, that's the direction we need to be going for campaigns. We need to make sure that they are long term and sustainable and here not for the moment, but for the movement. Thank you. Sam, what would you do differently? I would quite frankly echo both what uh, Nida and uh, Nelsie said. Um, first and foremost, that mental health component, making sure that you're taking care of yourself, um, that, that your personal life is, is uh, you know, healthy, um, that you're not completely immersed 24 seven in, in politics, because I think that can definitely eat away at you. Um, and, and having an outlet, someone to you know, take a step back with, um, I think is, is something that's very important and necessary if you wanna do this kind of work, which is very intense um, in, a, in a sustainable long-term manner. And uh, with what Nelsie said, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of the golden goose that I've always tried to obtain of how do we build out a long-term uh, sustainable infrastructure in which we have the capacity, especially as, you know, part-time legislators in Georgia who get ourselves paid less than the federal poverty level, um, but don't even have any funds allocated for staff. How do we build out a mechanism uh, in which we can continue to foster and help train you know, the next generation of candidates and leaders in our own communities? Um, you know, from, you know, I, I've again been through three general elections. Each campaign has been a little bit different, um, but I think the two similarities that that has remained the same is, again, that focus on having direct communications with voters, um, ideally with the candidate uh, yourself, um, and, then, and then two, people power. Um, well, to people power, one more thing I would add, I suppose, uh, would be I, I've always brought on um, newbies, uh, uh, folks who have had limited campaign experience and kind of taught them uh, the ends. And, and while that can be challenging and, and take a little more away from uh, the candidate, um, you know, I, I still feel that that's very much important and necessary, but how do you translate that or, or transform that into something that's long-term and sustainable? That, that's still something that I'm, I'm working on myself. Sustainability is a thing, right? And, you know, we know that the systems that currently exist weren't designed to keep our movement sustainable. So we're kind of creating it as we're building it, but I'm grateful that the, all of you are committed to building it. And I'm sure as a movement, we'll get there. So Sam, we'll start with you this time. Uh, as you mentioned, part-time legislature. So how much time and commitment would you recommend spending on running for part-time offices? And if successfully elected to part-time roles, how has that affected your career outside of your official roles? Great question. It's very close to home. Um, and, you know, I, I, sometimes I feel like I must be crazy, right? Because I'm raising tens of thousands of dollars, you know, $50,000, $100,000 per election cycle uh, to ultimately be in a position that pays me, you know, $17,000 or about $1,000 a month as a part time state legislator in Georgia. Um, not sustainable uh, whatsoever. Um, but I, I, at least for me, that's why knowing yourself and knowing the reason why you're running is so important because you have to have something that sustains you and drives you um, to, to get, out, get up out of bed and do this work that is very, very important. Um, that said, um, you know, for going back to my first campaign, I was working as an attorney um, uh, in the private sector, uh, full-time fighting foreclosures and repossessions. Um, I left that job um, so that I could build out a, cam uh, a, a campaign and do that full time for about five to six months. Um, thankfully, I had some money saved up. And since I was taking care of my mother full time and, and, you know, with her living at home, I had a low overhead costs and expenses. So I was able to make that work. Uh, definitely not sustainable in the long run. Um, but I had the uh, opportunity to go all in, uh, particularly given the race that I was engaged in of trying to unseat a three-term Republican incumbent. Um, that said, the first two years I was in office was very challenging because my only source of income was a state legislator. 
you're not going to find many law firms unless you have your own practice that allows you to take the first quarter off of, of each year and all this additional time that has to go toward constituent services because you want to do a good job. You want to make yourself available year round. Um, that said, you know, I, I was thankfully able to persevere kind of the financial crunch and challenges that existed uh, immediately. But having the opportunity to serve as a legislator, advocating for an expansion of healthcare in the state of Georgia created doors that I didn't know necessarily existed. Um, and, and so that's how I ended up with uh, the nonprofit that I'm with right now, where I serve as general counsel that provides financial stability um, in which I can still, uh, you know, hone my passion as to why I ran for office um, while also working in the HIV AIDS epidemic in Georgia um, in a flex that provides the flexibility necessary for me to do both. I, you know, I have long days still, don't get me wrong, you know, 80 hour weeks, 70 hour weeks, um, whether I'm in session or out of session or on the campaign trail. Um, but, you know, at least for now, again, for me, it's worth it. Um, you know, the impact that I can have on my community is worth it. And, and at least for me, again, it's uh, an opportunity to live a purpose-driven life, which uh, is important to me. Thank you, Sam. Nelsie or Nida, would you like to chime in? Yeah, I can share. I'd say this is something that I still try to figure out to this day. So I will do my best to share, to respond based on my experience. And when I was campaigning for office, I was working full time at Take Action Minnesota. And it's a social justice organization here in Minnesota. And literally right as I clocked out, it was campaign mode. Um, so my day pretty much looked like eight to four, four thirty work, and then I'm done with work, and then I'm campaigning in the evening, making phone calls, door knocking, or being in campaign team meetings. It pretty much went like that for the rest of the year. I'm not kidding you. And so it really will take dedication, especially depending on, you have to really consider the factors. Like for me, I was a first time candidate. There were five other folks in the race and we were all, for, with the exception of one, we were all people of color. And so there was a, a lot to do in terms of organizing and engaging voters. Um, and, and like when you get elected, uh, which in St. Paul here, the, the role is a part-time position, you really have to make a choice on, on what you want to do with your time. So pretty much all of the council members in St. Paul, we only do our council work because it is so demanding. It is part-time, but it is basically full-time. How I've, I have learned to really manage my time is I've started to, when I got elected, I started to think about how I wanted to use it. Like, did I keep wanna, did I want to continue running campaigns to get other people elected? The answer was yes, definitely. So I made sure to carve that into my schedule. And then I started talking with my staff as well. I have a legislative aide and also an executive assistant in the office and made sure that we figured out what three days would work best for me to basically be in the office because anytime that I wasn't, it was like either uh, I would be with family or I would be running campaigns. And so those are all the, the big buckets of work that I juggle. And I, I do not believe in the whole concept around elected officials needing to completely exhaust ourselves and drain ourselves and not make time for being human. Because if we're talking about about a new type of politics that's rooted in caring for each other and sustainability, then it means that we as elected officials need to also have integrity and practice that ourselves too. So this is something that all of you are gonna have to think about and you don't even have to run for office to be thinking about this. This is something we should be reevaluating every single day in our life. Definitely a shifted mindset. And Nida, would you like to offer anything on this? Yeah, um, for me as a county commissioner, that's also a part-time position. It's, you know, a part-time job with like practically full-time work. And I'm so glad that Representative Park uh, noted one thing about how, you know, running for these local positions and serving in these seats 
um, a lot of times that you have to be like self-sufficient. Uh, um, you had mentioned, you know, individuals who have their own law firms. And that's how a lot of our uh, elected positions are here in North Carolina, is that there's not room for young people to be able to run for local office because we're just getting started with our lives. We're looking for financial stabi stability. Running for office and making fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year is not a viable option for us. Um, and especially for me right now, like my husband's in full uh, full time student, so I have to continue working. And obviously, like you know, I love being able to like be a commissioner and finding a job that like has that balance, but also recognizing that we have a huge problem in the infrastructure of how things work, and that's something that we need to start shifting and programs like Run for Something and New American Leaders are addressing that problem that why are all of our elected officials, like most of our state legislature in North Carolina for a long time has been older white men um, because they have their own businesses, they have institutional uh, generational wealth that makes it easier for them to be able to run for office. Even they're making the decisions for a constituency that they don't even actually accurately represent all of the time, but they're able to win these seats because they have that uh, financial support. And so I think it's really important for like, when you're running for office, if you're considering that to make sure that you have a conversation with your employer, um, if there's any conflict there, but also spending time to look for careers and opportunities that, you know, may, supplement your work, um, whether you work on a campaign or work for a progressive organization on the side, um, those tend to be a lot more supportive. And that's what I've gotten to do is I found a progressive policy organization um, that still aligns with my values and is supportive of me as an elected official and allows for that flexibility to be able to balance having work sessions in the middle of the day, having to have those constituency meetings, um, but making sure that, you know, we we address it by finding ways to adjust our lives, but also working towards institutional change that, you know, in the future down the road, we don't constantly continue to have only people who are who running for office is accessible to um, continue to do so. It should be accessible to everyone. Thank you. And that's what uh, we're all about, right? Making our democracy accessible to everyone in every way, whether it's by them exercising their right to vote or them running for office. So um, before, for the next set of questions, I, I'll just ask uh, each one of you separately. So all three of you won't answer the question. It'll just be one person answering the question, if that's okay. And so for, um, for Nida, the question is, what was the political landscape in your local community? And did that make it easier for you or did it complicate your race? So I ran in a very blue district. Um, my county is blue. I will say, however, that being the first Muslim American woman, and I believe the first Muslim in my county as well, um, there was still definitely some uh, negativity that I had to endure. Unfortunately, I have seen a lot more open dialogue around uh, the idea of Muslims being elected to office. I remember, you know, at the polls, um, there was somebody who was working at the polls for another Democratic candidate that I was running against, um, telling voters, no one's going to vote for her because of that thing on her head. And when I heard that, I was very surprised because again, like these are all Democrats running against me. Why do we need to stoop down to this level? But those type of difficult like things you would hear, it just would solidify for me why important, why it's so important for me to run because those narratives and conversations are gonna to continue to happen until we break the barriers, until people start to become comfortable and familiar with seeing someone who looks like me, someone who wears the headscarf in an elected position. And it makes it easier for young Muslim girls who look and see, oh, there's a Muslim woman who's elected to office in the South. Um, that means it's not impossible for us. It's not impossible for us to volunteer on a campaign, to work on a campaign, not just run for office. Um, but yeah, that political landscape. And also my county is very politically active where they love to get involved with everything, which is amazing. But it's definitely something interesting to balance with, you know, you are opening your, 
your complete self up to the public when you run for office. Um, you don't have a lot of privacy once you run for office. Everyone wants to know everything about you. Um, and they believe that they deserve to know everything about you. And I think it's important to like set barriers that there are some things like your private life that you can keep to yourself, um, your family and your friends. Thank you. Um, for Nelsie, so while Nida was talking about things she experienced while running, uh, what does it feel like once you're elected? Have there been certain obstacles as uh, being a new American that you think is different from the experience of others? And if so, how did you overcome them? Or how are you overcoming them while you govern? All right, so um, thank you so much for that question. The experience once um, once you're elected, oh, I'll speak from my own personal experience. When I was elected, I felt like everything that I experienced during my campaign only got heightened. So what I mean by that is the, the unsolicited advice that we often get during campaigns that you will often get when you're campaigning too, you're still going to get them and you're going to get them even more as well as you are in elected office like people really want to tell you how you should vote on something which you should listen but there are some folks who are just really entitled um, to 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 you and that was what that's what um, what I constantly uh, experience as somebody who's young and someone who is a, a woman as well and every time that I you know, differ in opinion with other people, then now they feel they have the audacity to use my my title as a council member to uh, invalidate me and say, well, this is the exactly why you are not fit for this, um, which is not true at all, because like these are probably the same people who didn't support you during your campaign. <laughs> I'll just be perfectly honest. And so while we often uh, feel pressed to make everyone happy. I just want you to know, not everyone is going to support you in your campaign, just like how not everyone is going to support you during your election. And also the amount of people who do, that, that number continues to grow day by day. And people are always reevaluating their their support for you as you're in elected office, office, especially if you decide to even rerun for office as well. So that being said, it's really important to just always stay really grounded to, to what you believe in, to what you're fighting for, and to remember like why you ran for office in the first place, which is something that other folks on the panel here have said over and over because it is so, so true. Um, I, there was another part to the question. I want to make sure I answer. I think you got it. I think you oh, covered. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. You covered both parts. Sorry, I was muted by accident. Uh, for Representative Park, what's the toughest vote you've ever had to make as a state rep? That, that's a tough question. Hmm. So I, I, I the, the one that I continue to think back on is um, in regards to Medicaid expansion, but um, it was a Medicaid waiver. Um, it was the governor's proposal, uh, our current governor's proposal to try and um, address the big uninsured problem. Um, given the, given how, the, how vague the language was, um, you know, it was very challenging. Um, and, and I think ultimately, um, I, I didn't vote because I was so happy um, to see that our state was finally making progress on this issue. Sorry, my, my cat's bothering me a little bit. <laughs> um, so I, I was so um, happy that our state was finally making even incremental progress on this important issue. But yet, you know, all of my colleagues were like, no, it's either Medicaid expansion or nothing. Ultimately, uh, it wasn't, it was vague in the bill itself, but ultimately it depended upon how the governor would apply for the waiver itself. Um, and the actual application of CMS was very limited, would have covered about 25,000 out of 500,000 Georgians. It included work requirements and was just terrible. But 
Um, you know, I, I want to echo one of the things that Nelsie said, which is when you're in a legislative body, it doesn't get easier. Um, you know, I think the campaign trail, it really just hones you for some of the challenges that you're going to face, because regardless of how you vote on certain issues, people are going to hate on you. Um, and, and there's every single vote to a certain degree is difficult. Um, you want to stand, and there's so many different layers of politics in which you want to stand by your, your colleagues and your caucus members, yet you need to do everything that you can to advocate for your district. The interests of the district that you represent may be contrary to what, um, to a community that you belong to, whether it's the LGBTQ community or the Asian American community. Um, and it's a balancing act. But again, uh, to reiterate the point that Nelsie made, it's you have to know yourself. You have to have as strong of a moral compass and moral clarity um, as you can when you go into these very challenging uh, environments to ultimately make the best decision that you can um, uh, for, for yourself and for those you serve more, more importantly. That's a tough thank question. You. <laughs> yeah, no, and thank you for acknowledging that, you know, in a way, every vote is tough. And there's always people who are for and against things, but if you know yourself, then you can stand by your values and hopefully vote for them. Um, so before we wrap up, I wanna thank everyone for their thoughtful questions. And before I hand back over to Andrea from Run For Something, the last question that uh, we'll start with Representative Park and then just go around is, what is the one thing you wish you knew going into your campaign? I, one thing I wish I knew, I, you know, I wish I knew what I was getting into to a certain degree. Um, you know, I, you know, felt like I was, um, sorry, um, I, I felt like I was catapulted uh, when I first went, ran for office. And there were many uh, challenges that were unexpected, you know, endorsing in a democratic primary, uh, trying to balance uh, my personal life with my political and professional life. Um, but when all is said and done, again, I think uh, I don't regret taking the leap of faith. Um, I, I wish I, I knew parts of myself a little bit better, but again, you, you grow, you learn, and, and you continue to do the best that you can do. Thank you. Nida, what's the one thing you wish you knew before your campaign? And you described it as a sprint, so I'm sure there's something that you would like to share. Honestly... What I wish I knew more about my campaign um, is not necessarily what I wish I knew more about my campaign or about campaigning, but necessarily what I wish I knew to do better as a candidate um, is really continuing to have conversations about policy and always centering conversations back to that. Um, especially as an AAPI candidate, as a Muslim woman, as an immigrant, a lot of times conversations can get shifted into like, you know, your identity and what um, you represent. Uh, but shifting conversations back to, you know, this is what policy really matters to me and how it impacts the communities that I do represent, but also how it impacts all communities um, across Durham County, across North Carolina. And yeah. Thank you. And Nelsie, what's the one thing you wish you knew before you started your first campaign? I wish I knew how joyful the work was and to the ability to be able to be within a team who shared my same values, just like how joyful that was because after my campaign, I craved being able to recreate that space again for me. And I say for me personally, because I know everyone's experience is really different. And um, during my campaign, I did not just you know build a campaign team, but I built a family who was in the movement for social and racial and gender justice. And there are people who I continue going back to every single day to lean on and uh, to, you, uh, you know, to talk to so for empowerment, for grounding. And that's exactly like why, um, you know, we're working on building out the campaign movement again for, for, for long term. And it's something that's brought me so much joy. And I, I would encourage everyone to 
to really think deeply about what they would want out of an experience like this as well. Because while it looks different for everyone, we get to make the choice on how we want to run our campaign. I love that. We do. We And oftentimes when we're faced with daunting systems and people who don't represent us accurately and don't feel like they're aligned with our values, it's easy to forget that we actually all have choices and we really step into our power by exercising those choices and making them thoughtfully. So thank you so much. And I want to thank all three of you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to mod moderate this session. And I'm going to actually turn it over to Andrea who will close it, close us out. So. Andrea, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much. And let me reiterate that thank you to everyone, to, to our wonderful moderator and our panelists, Sam, Nelsie, for sharing your experiences and wisdom with us tonight. It really makes all the difference to building the community and giving people a foothold to think about running for office. We also want to thank everyone who participated and asked wonderful questions that helped the conversation really be rich and fulfilling. Everyone on this call will be getting an email from us with resources from Run for Something and New American Leaders Action Fund to use as you consider running or in your run for office. Um, we also want to, again, encourage everyone on this call to consider running for office in your community soon. We need you and we're here to support you. So thank you very much for joining us tonight and I hope that everyone has a good evening. Thank you again.